And hello, everybody. Welcome back to Artful Tuesdays. My name is Kirk Barbera, and today I'm joined by Sandra Shaw. Uh oh, I have. Do you guys hear that? I, I heard hear it. You. Oh, that's my fault. I had YouTube on. I apologize, everybody. I had YouTube, and I was <laughs> hearing myself echoing in the background. So I apologize for that false start, but. Sandra Shaw, welcome to the show, and apologize for that uh, mishap at the beginning, but um, Sandra is a sculptor and an art historian, and it sounds like a world traveler. <laughs> is that correct? Would you call yourself a world traveler? Oh, I've never thought of myself that way, but I have done some uh, traveling uh, to look at art. Yeah, which is, by the way, the way I want to travel. Uh, I have not traveled much off the, out, you know, out of America. I've on the continents a bit, but mm. I really want to travel the world from a, a art perspective to see oh, art fabulous. that That's I a love. Great way there. to go. Yeah. Rather than just going randomly wherever, just because, Oh, this is a cool spot. Like, great. Oh no, this is where Parthenon is, or this is the, the Louvre and this is, you know, all, all the great. obvious spots. Yeah. And today we're going to be talking about her book, which is all shiny uh, windows on humanity Pre, it's a, a history of how art reflects our ideas about our lives and world, prehistory to the fall of Rome. Now, I, I've fallen in love with this book. Um, and this, Sandra, is this your first book, I take it? Yes. Okay, it's your first book. And this is, I, I saw on your website, you have sold over 200 sculptures, including that wonderful bust of Ayn Rand, which was at um, the Ayn Rand Institute, where I, I, um, I work now, actually, at the and Rand Institute, but not in the offices. And so wonderful art historian, wonderful sculptress. And you have brought a lot of that or all that knowledge and experience to this book, which yes. I think is a very valuable book. Um, now, before I had some, some thoughts I wanted to get into, but before we get into that, I wanted to you know, make sure I include you and in stuff. Otherwise, it's just going to be me talking. And I wanted to ask, what was the impetus to start writing this particular book for you? Uh, it was a combination of, of things. I, I mean, I, um, I've been speaking on uh, art and history of art. I, it's a subject I can't leave alone. I love it. It's just in me. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, Peter Laporte invited me to, uh, to do the book and he supported mm. that project. So on the one hand, uh, it was completely natural for me to do it, but I don't know if I would have headed into a, a project of that scope uh, it is robust that, uh, Dr. Yeah. Laporte's uh, support I was a Laporte teacher for a couple of years actually I taught fifth and eighth grade at Laporte in oh, Irvine grand. yeah and I loved it I, you know it's it yeah. my um, yeah I really it's a real it. challenge to te teach children to figure <laughs> out their context of knowledge that was like yeah. the biggest challenge for me it is it is a wonderful challenge and so I wanted to start our discussion with um, a, a, a lesson for the audience from me about sales. And let me explain. So I, I wanted to start somewhere unique, I thought. And I, you know, I was drawing from my own experience when I was thinking about your book. And I've been in sales a lot of my life. I started off after high school in sales. And one of the things you learn about sales is how to build rapport with people. Right, like quick ways to build rapport. Like I used to knock on people's doors and try to sell them stuff. Oh man, that yeah, was a hard job, and and you have to build rapport really fast. And I have one thing they teach you very early on is when you enter a person's house, or even when you're walking up the lawn, you should be doing an inventory of the things around you that they have selected to include in their lives. And when you go into a house, you should look at the paintings on the wall. You should look at what's on the coffee table. You should look at the kinds of things they have in the kitchen and you know, so on and so forth. What pictures do they have? Do they have a dog? All those kinds of things are material to build relationships in, and really to get to know the person you're talking to. And one, I just want to say that I cannot believe how many people I've <laughs> over the years, got, not only gone to their houses, but like gone to a dinner party with a whole bunch of people and Nobody asks questions about this person's household, right? Like this is something we put, people put a lot of thought or, you know, they value the things around them. They put in the, the you know, they put in their house. 
And I was making this um, kind of connection when I was thinking about this book as a coffee table book, which I love coffee table books. I think this is amazing coffee. It's a big book. And I just had all these flashbacks of like going into people's houses and asking them about their coffee table book. And the thing that that made me connect to your artwork is that what I was taught from a sales perspective is how to excavate a human life, right? Like I'm, I'm going into one person's life and try to excavating what's going on in their life to, to reverse engineer their values and ask them about their values. And that's what this book does, but on an epic cultural scale, right? You're going back to the paleolithic time with the evidence that we have and you're excavating. Now, how, what do you, what do you look for? I mean, you look for whatever remnants you have, but the thing that people spend the time to cultivate, to put around them, to, you know, to, to surround themselves with, that's what's important to that. Right. Yeah. And that, I think that um, lesson is really, is just such a valuable life lesson that a lot of us aren't taught that and it's kind of natural. We do this automatically, whether we think about it or not. And that's the point, like what we surround ourselves with, whether we think about it or not, right, is very valuable. And very yeah, you don't important. always think. About it. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. And that was kind of what was hitting me was like when you're. I was reading through this. We're excavating these great historical periods, and we're getting a kind of sense of what's going on in, in their culture and what they value. Um, and yeah. so that was just a kind of sales. Lessons yes, that and, that, and that's a pati- particularly challenging in cultures like the prehistoric cultures, where there isn't documentation. Nobody's yeah. explaining anything about why they're doing what they're doing and, and whatnot, or what or what their artworks mean. Um, and when you're when you're faced with that, you have to really, I mean, you're you're thinking through well, what what kind of a life are these people living? And why would they take the time and effort uh, to make works of art, for God's sakes? They're living in, in a, their world is mm. desperate, violent, uh, irrational in many ways. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, they have to go out and kill uh, dangerous animals in order to survive, to, 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 to feed on them. What kind of a life is that? But yeah. and then they and then they stop and go make a painting. I mean, it must have been extremely important to them to make those paintings. Yeah, to spend the time to do that, and you make a connection. Um, and I don't know if you're the only one who's made this connection, but that what separates Neolith, um, Neanderthal man and uh, Cro Magnum man was the creation of art. That's one thing that they, that Cro-Magnum man did. And we descend from that. Neanderthal man is one of the subspecies of humans that has perished. And one thought is maybe there's some kind of connection between what they did with art, which I found absolutely fascinating. It's it's speculative. I I speculate speculate. that the art uh, helped them stay focused on their Mm -hmm. goals, that it was inspirational in showing them the, the successful fruits of their hunts. Uh, so, yes. But that's, it's speculative to, certainly um, they, they had more going for them uh, cognitively, conceptually uh, over the Neanderthals. And the evidence for that is in the quality of their, their weapons, uh, the refinement of their weapons and so forth. So we know that about them. But whether or not the art played a role in in enabling them to survive, whereas Neanderthal didn't have that source of inspiration, that's it's speculative to think that. But but we can know that they didn't have that. So that's one that's major right. difference that's right. that we could say. Well, that's an essential difference between right. two species. And now we might be able to say that like maybe the progression to art. Was a was some kind of leap or something? We don't, you know. Obviously, that's in the the mists of time. We're never going to know about, but we can definitely make the connection that there's something fundamental about art and survival, right? And, yes, and, and yeah. In in terms of the six su- the success that Cro Magnon had surviving, I mean, much earlier peoples, um, you know, made jewelry or 
they cre- created pigments. Mm-hmm. We speculate that they painted their bodies or they painted their weapons or, but that's not creation of art to yeah. actually recreate something uh, based on observation and modify it, stylize it in such a way to dramatize something. Mm-hmm. Cro-Magnon, as far as we know, was the only Cro-Magnon one. was the first. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so one of the values of this book that you wrote, um, besides all the wonderful art and the, the just generally as a history, you know, lover is exactly what you're talking about is that you show examples of what you mean by stylized, which is a word that I've heard a lot, but one of my favorites that I just thought of off the top of my head, I forgot to get you to um, get this one, but it's just like a cave painting of some kind of, I don't know if it's a rhinoceros and it's got the horn. Oh, you yes. Have, you have yes, a skeleton. The yeah, the rhino. You have a skeleton. With the massive with shoulders yeah. or withers. Yeah. yeah, and it has the massive withers and it has the big tusk that comes yes. all the way around. And you it's kind extravagant, of, isn't it's it? Extravagant, it's extravagant. Yeah. Extravagance about the line work. And you, yeah, and you have like an actual picture of the skeleton to show a comparison yes, of what that they it were was true with. to nature, but yeah. more so exaggerated and stylized. Yes. Which I think, like all the examples of the pictures that go along with it, and there's a lot. This is 500 pages. It's these are big pages. Lots. Yes, of about artwork. half the book is devoted to images. I think yeah. there's over 500. Yeah. Full color and, images. And they're not like randomly chosen. They, they emphasize and, you know, demonstrate the points you're making, you know, like the stylized point, the, the emphasizing and, and how they were stylizing nature and emphasizing things that were important to them. For instance, like a rhino tusk would have been terrifying to them to some degree. So they yes. overemphasize yes. it because that's what in their mind is state. So like this, you know, and that's just one sentence out of this whole book. So there's, so much value in the book to kind of seeing like, okay, here's what this means. Here's what this term means that you don't often get. Um, and I've read. Oh, yes. I took to great care to explain, um, describe in, in simple layman's terms, uh, the, uh, any of the art terms that I use. Yeah. And uh, it, yeah, I didn't take anything for granted. I wanted to make sure that the person who knows zero about art and our history understands what's being said. And that's why, so like when I was thinking about who this is really great for, so, you know, it goes through these eras, these major eras, you know, what is it? Paleolithic, um, Mesopotamian. Neolithic, Mesopotamian. Yeah. Um, Egyptian. And, and Egyptian, classical Aegean, Greece. Uh, yeah, or, or pre-Greek and then the classical and then. Archaic, like, classical, yeah. Hellenistic, and then Roman. Yes, thank you. So you go through these things, these yeah. these specific eras, and I, you know. So one thing is, I think anybody who is any kind of teacher of the humanities uh, at any level should have this book, right? Um, yes, yes. If if they're developing curricula, um, even for general history, even for general history, yeah, general history, cultural history, and um, this is K through 12 our... and college, I would say, like, yes. I think it's valuable. So if you're teaching anything or you're at all related to the humanities, I think this is a must book because it gives you a lot of these examples that I've been talking about, that, you know, but that's just one or two. I mean, there are hundreds of these great yeah, connections. And the wonderful thing about the artworks is they're like a, a special kind of artifact. Yes. And they're, they're vivid, they're memorable. You can you can use art to distill or encapsulate a whole culture. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so I think that that's really. Um, and let's give another example. So this is one that I did have a picture of that really again struck me for a couple of reasons. I mean, so many of them do, but like it, it made me realize something about how we as humans value things. And there is uh, and, and as, as cultural, so. I've my whole life have been told this cliche that in the past, uh, men val- you were attracted to a, a heavy set women. That's something I've heard. And, and you know, the, the um, assumption was always that, well, something's wrong the with us. The woman. With a, what would you call it? The Rubenesque woman. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. I've, I have not heard it put that way. Um, 
but yeah, sure. I'll, I'll use that, that flattering term, yeah. I guess, Rubenesque, that Rubenesque woman. And, and the implication to me as always, you know, as a man who is not quite attracted to that, that there's something wrong with me, right. That, that I'm oh. programmed by, by Coca Cola, by beer commercials, by that. I heard this in philosophy class and I'm like programmed to only like a certain kind of thing. Um, you know, in the past they had different programming and that's why they had the kind of attraction they did, oh. which I, I thought was very superficial and in a, and not yes. quite correct. And when I was reading the yearbook, th- this was one of the revelations <clears throat> I had, I'm going to pull this up so people can see um, this is the Venus of um, what's the name? Willendorf. Willendorf. And why don't you tell us a little bit about this, um, this, this um, sculpture. Let me pull it up now. There There you go. Can you see that? Yeah. So this, this comes on early in the book. This is in the, um, the, you know, prehistory for sure. And it's uh, Cro-Magnon man, correct? Yes. Remember correctly. Yeah. So this is something he, you know, sculpted and I'll let you tell us a little bit more about it. Well, she's quite small. She's only about four inches. So she was something that could be held in the hand and, uh, Archaeologists uh, speculate that uh, she was mobile. Uh, mm. She was carried about. Uh, perhaps uh, she was a good luck charm. Uh, we don't know. We don't know if she represented a, f- a fertility spirit or goddess. Um, again, all of that speculation because we don't have any. Um, this is prehistory, so we have no documents. And by the way, I did want to say before we move on, because we have some super chat. Some people have given some money. One, Keith Didion oh, just, just bought your book. He said, you sold me, just ordered mine. Can't wait to get it. So Keith, thank you for ordering. Uh, oh, Jonathan, fabulous. super chat. Thank you for the super chat and um, jo- for a couple super chats. So thank you guys for your comments and for your super chats and supporting ARC UK. Now, uh, Sandra, back to you and this this um, fertility goddess, or not not a fertility goddess. Yeah, why am I wrong be. in saying that? She might have been. Okay, but why am I, like you? you point out that it may not be that can you explain the confusion well we don't know uh you know how uh, developed or or complex their religions were they were probably mystics they probably uh believed in spirits nature spirits and and, and so forth um and we don't know whether or not this figure was an idol or a votive offering uh, we, we don't know so there, there's this, um, the point you make in the book that stood out to me was that it, it was certain connections you were making about what you could, we can surmise about that culture. So a yeah. conclusion that they could make. So one, th- what they're doing when they're doing this uh, statue or this little, little figurine is they're um, putting their deepest values because they, they value this. This is something important enough to take time out of their day of, almost, you know, their day of, they didn't have leisure time. They had not no. dying time as well. You might like, it was a brutal world. And they, yeah, took if time. they were spending time doing something. It was real important. It was very important. And so this, you know, crafting this, you know, little figurine was going to be very important to them. And the, um, you know, I don't want to have that um, big figurine up the whole time, but you know, so they had this, this value of um, they must have made connections as as they were moving around as a nomadic tribe a and i'm kind of extrapolating from what you said but basically malnourished women as they traveled and didn't have as much access to food gave birth to less healthy babies very nourished women who were stationary at home had all the meat and berries and everything they could eat gave birth to healthy babies and so they can make this connection over hundreds and even thousands of years and so they would, what they're valuing is not um, obesity or heaviness or Rubenesque women. What they're valuing is fecundity, is fertility. And yeah. so whenever I've heard, Likely. which is, you know, I think it's an obvious connection, but I think it's important to kind of dig deep because I've just heard that story so many times that, you know, oh, men of the past were, you know, like they were more open-minded. So they were open to, you know, uh, heavier women or something like, like men today are, you know, superficial because they don't like that. And it's, no, it's what that meant was inactivity, right? What they were valuing was an inactive woman 
passively sitting down, yes. eating and being there just. And that to- must have implied that the tribe was very successful because mm-hmm. somebody could afford to sit around. To sit around uh, and, and, and give birth. Uh, and, and that's put it. Put on weight. And put on weight and give birth to these healthy babies. But today what we value is active value pursuers as women, right? And the, the reason I just get upset at that is because I, as a guy, have just heard that so much. Oh, and, dear, I'm so sorry. And I just think that that's inaccurate. I think like what they were valuing in the past was women as a passive valued object. And we today value women as pursuers, as active, as physical in the world, able to conquer the world just like men can. And, you know, so we, we do value. Almost. We're, we're not as physically strong okay. as you. That's true. Okay. Sure um, that we distinguish uh, <laughs> that. I know that's not, that we'll probably be uh, canceled for, for no, 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 I, acknowledging yeah. this, but men are better at uh, certain physical, certain physical things. Yeah. And that's important about men. I, I, yeah, and I agree. I'm, I'm not, I'm just trying to make the point about inactivity and activity. Right. And being pers- like, a pure valued versus value. And I just, you know, made that, I'm not saying that women are not valued and shouldn't be valued. Of course they, men should as well. I'm just making, it just, for me, was just a connection I made when I was reading your book about. Yeah. And it's interesting that that. the, the, the explanations that you were getting in school were so superficial. Yeah. And my aim in the book is, is, is to, to deal with something art that you could deal with at a very superficial level of beauty and refinement and surfaces and colors and so forth. But I'm digging deeper to the conceptual origin of, of art and how art is reflective of thought and, mm-hmm. and values what's most important to people uh, because human beings are, are serious beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we face life and death choices every day and um, art reflects us. And we, yeah, so like that's a, a picture that comes out of this whole book is understanding the, those underlying things because, yeah, that we, we've been given a somewhat bad, being nice, we've been given a pretty bad education, modern man in art and in humanities. And I think Yes. It's, you know, it's a grab bag of sometimes you'll get something interesting, but a lot of times it's boring, n- yes, disconnected. And, and, uh, and uh, one, uh, when I was writing this and I was thinking, well, who would really gain from this? And for me, the most challenging reader was someone I just call an engineering student. Yeah. Someone who just <laughs> doesn't value art has been turned off it uh, at some point. Uh, and, and I really feel for people uh, who, who never discover art or can't respond to it. Or, uh, and, and, and part of that has to do with the way that the art has been presented to us um, as like a, a kind of sideshow, as, as not integrated, not integral to life, as being apart from the serious things of life like an entertainment or a distraction from uh, reality. So, and particularly in the modern, modern age where art is, is um, deeply irrational and is, is disconnected from reality and, and, and our cognition. Uh, so I, I completely empathize with anyone who, who, cannot uh, derive fulfillment from art. Well, I would, I would say that I, so I'm a hundred percent on board with you. It's one of my life missions to inspire people to explore art because I say this all the time. I was not raised loving art. I didn't love poetry until I was like 27. And I listened to Leonard Peikoff's poems. I like and oh. love and that, you know, cause I was always afraid of it. I hated it. And then he just made it so approachable that I've read tons of it. You know, I have a first edition. That's a first edition of Wordsworth right there. That's Wordsworth. Oh. I love, I, I just fought like it's actually changed, absolutely changed my life so much. And I want to bring that to other people. And that's one of the, my motivations for a lot of these, this artful Tuesday and things like this is 
I think guys, if, if you're in that engineer, you're the computer program programmer. And a lot of my friends in Austin, you are, and I get it. You have to explore art. You're missing life. Like there's, there's a so much pleasure. And I mean, you know, pleasure, like pleasure is the right word, I think. And art. Yes. Now, pleasure and, and discovery. And discovery. You get to discover yourself, other people. Yes. Like I was saying, excavating about that person you're going into their house. You want yes. to excavate them and get to know them. Otherwise, why are you going to their house? Like, don't, yes. don't go yes. there, right? Art, art is like a, a visual imprint of man's soul. Yeah. Yes. And while we're on this subject, I think there might be confusion. I've had confusion about you know, we, we you know, because we we apply art to so many things. You know, we, we mm-hmm. call wall art art, we call right. decorations art. There's the art of de- dentistry, you know. There's the art of dentistry, and there's just there's everything's, you know, I've put this room together in an artistic way. Well, yes. I don't know, whatever. There's yeah. just and there, that's true in terms of there's skill involved, perhaps, but there is a difference, and you make a good distinction in the beginning of the book between um fine art and you know, what might be more broadly considered art, perhaps. And I thought it was helpful. So I'm going to pull up the image that um, where you talk about this. And this is a, a buck, a, the creation of Adam and the buccaneer pirate, right? Yes. And why don't you explain which one? And, and I'm going to let you guys, the audience, guess which one do you think is fine art just by looking at it? <laughs> which like which one, which of these is fine art and which is not? And then Sandra, maybe you can explain why. Well, and, and this is a tough one because uh, the the painting on the right by Howard Pyle is, I mean, he was a, 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 a very fine painter and some of his works are what I would consider to be fine art. This particular painting of his, of a buccaneer was an illustration for a book and of course, the, uh, the figure on the left by Michelangelo, it's a Renaissance uh, portrayal of Adam. Uh, uh, he's just been created by, by God, who's, whose hand is coming in from the right. Um, and uh, the, the, the distinction uh, between these, these two figures is that uh, the Adam, of course, is, is nude. And um, he is, he's, he's exhibiting something that's true of all human beings. Um, his physique, um, his, his healthiness, his relaxation, um, you know, the kind of arising of, of, his, of his awareness, his gesture of, of um, reaching out and, and contacting God. Uh, these kinds of attributes are true of all human beings, or potentially so. On the right, the buccaneer is just, is uh, identified by his his outfit, his his weapon, his his stash. Uh, he's his reference is limited. His what he's presenting is true of buccaneers, which is a limited subject. It's not universal men or all men, potentially all men and women. Um, so that it's the, the profundity of what's uh, being conceptualized and uh, dramatized is what uh, distinguishes fine art from other visual arts. What do you think of this? I think it's a, you know, a scale, right? So yes, it's yes. not there, like there it's- is a continuum. Yeah, continuum. It's, it's not, not a hard. Like, yeah. So, you know, the more universal you go, the more it's fine art. Yeah. And and that is one way. So that's it's a, not that's like the, a nice way of putting it. Yeah. It's not like the, the buccaneer has no value. It's not good Correct. art. It's not worthy of contemplation. That's not what we're saying. Exactly. And there's a lot of very specific types of art that it, that are very specific in certain ways that are very valuable. But there is something grand you know, when you, when you, when you do see something truly universal that affects anybody of any, you could take somebody in a primitive culture and put them in front of this and they will react to it. Right. They will have some, whereas this other one, they're going to be like, what's that thing on his shoulder? What's that thing over there? Like, oh, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah. So there's a kind of, yes, univers- there's a lot of particulars. 
yeah. um, to the Buccaneer that you have to know uh, about. You have to know, um, you know, who, you know, what sort of occupation <laughs> is this? Is, yeah, you know, exactly. Why is he holding those things and those weapons? And, the occupation, yeah. I love it. Yeah, because, yeah, and I can imagine even some, you know, school kids today who aren't taught history at all might be like, what's, you know, what are, what are those things like legitimately asking? And yeah. th so they're going to miss out on the artwork. Now, you know, that that's again, neither here nor there to some degree. I'm, I'm not trying to make a point against certain kinds of art. I just think I like the distinction. To the help you. Yeah, yeah, there is a difference. Fine art. And, and like, there's a, I like the, the scale situation. So that was, you know, the, the, the book that, um, you know, the, the, this book that we're talking about, we have, a progression that happens throughout it, it seems that you do build. So you can cherry pick your way through it and read things. Yes. It's, it's a good browsing book. It's a very good browsing book. And that's why I love it as a coffee table. Again, put on your coffee table. And then when people come over, if they've been trained by Kirk, they will ask you what's, what's that? Cause that's, if you put something on your coffee table and Kirk comes over, I'm going to ask you about it. I'm like, Hey, what is that? And, and tell me a little bit about that. And then if I see you light up, I'm like, okay, this person really passionate about this. That's, I want to learn more about that because I want to learn this person. So this book is a great coffee table book. Um, it'll also make you look deeper and cooler. So get the book for that purpose. Uh, Cause I'll make you feel, look like a great, That's um, superficial. great person. It is a little superficial, but Hey, selling some books, baby, just put them on your coffee table and look good. Um, it's, it's as long as we're selling a couple books, but I would I encourage you also to read it. It's a good book to read as well um, for the purpose, for the reasons that we've been talking about. Now, uh, I really, another aspect of the book that I really picked up on was that progression idea that we've kind of talked about with the pro, um, pro, pro Magnum, the Neanderthal, but the Neanderthal, but also it seemed like the Mesopotamians were pulling from the, Neolithic era a little bit. There. Yes. You know, and there was a kind of building and the building Greeks, the first cities. Yeah. And there was a building. And I want to ask you if I'm crazy here. So um, this is an experience I had as a non-art historian, but just someone who was starting to get into art and learning about it. Is I saw um in a, a, a book I read in college called Art and Experience, I saw this thing called the geometric horse, which you talk about in your book, right? You talk about the geometric horse, which is um, 750 BC. So this is the time of Homer. Yeah, um, This is the time of Homer. And I, I saw this and, and I um, have always thought it'd be cool to see like Greek art in person. I don't think I ever have. Uh, I've seen replicas at like the Getty and things like that. But I was in Denver and I was in some just random museum. And I remember... I was walking around and I saw this horse and no I was like, kidding. wait a second. And, and I was like, wait a second, wait a second. This cannot be the horse I'm thinking about. Right. And I looked at the date and the date said, and I'm just, I can't remember the exact date, but it said something like 1475 AD. And I was like, what? And it was some, I don't know if it was Aztec or Inca, it was some uh, North American or, or South American tribe. Oh. And, I'd done it. and I just, you know, for some reason, and it was very, it was not exactly like this, it was very, very similar to this kind of style, this level. And it, I don't know if I'm crazy, but it does seem some cultures progress, some cultures maybe stagnate a little bit and they're a little bit behind yes. other cultures. And it was just a connection I made about how lucky we are to have the Greeks and to have that progression whatever happened magically, I want to say magical, it's not, but it feels like magic. It didn't happen all over the world and places it didn't happen to stagnated to, you know, this level and the places it did happen to, you know, progress to levels where they were able to have, you know, things like, like this. And this is one, if we have time. And, we and when you that. think of what the Greeks achieved, I mean, they came out of their dark age making, little geometric figures like that yeah and that's what they started with that's what they started with right? that's what the, and and they could have stagnated and they could have just 
been satisfied to do that forever to, to 1400 AD or whatever they could have done that. Yeah. So I'm not crazy though, to, to, to make that connection. Cause it, we live in a multicultural era where you're not able to say some cultures are better <laughs> superior than others. Oh, I um, see what you're saying. And so people would never talk well, about I mean, the, the that story of, of art is really tracking man's cognitive achievements or failures. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. 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 As is that there are connections and some cultures progress better than others. Right. That's right. And that's, and they just do. Um, well, they're bits by choice. So that, that's what I was going to ask you next. That's an interesting question to develop is yeah so the greeks made the choice why the greek why did like do you think it was just free will random they decided they decided and no one else decided well, i would say it was just why random the um the, yeah. their, the context for their achievement is that they were to a great extent free from the the traditional theocracies they didn't have a priesthood. They didn't have an organized, powerful priesthood like the Egyptians. They didn't have the, mo- the brutal monarchies that the Mesopotamians had. They were relatively free of all of that. And they were, in, in a sense, starting from, from scratch out of a dark age where you had devastations and uh, Interesting. And so they were, they were, they were, in a way, it's, it's exaggerated to say this, but they were at liberty to do X, Y, Z. And they, you know, there were some among them who uh, were ambitious about using their minds mm-hmm. and learning about the world. So I... And that's cumulative, and then you know, they're the the people who followed had to choose whether or not they were going to continue with that challenge. Yeah. yeah, and they did, and they took on more challenges, and made more connections, and made more discoveries, and that's how it would have gotten going. So it wasn't random; it was by choice. But it wasn't as though they sat back. So let's. Let's choose to think today. Let's choose to <laughs> have a rational society. You know, it wasn't like that. Yeah. It, That's how I have to talk to myself every morning. Let's choose to think today. <laughs> yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So, yeah, when I, I took an ancient Greek history class, I'm like speculating I said, now, of course, no, yeah. because no one documented this. But I'm yeah, just, it's, what, it's it, impossible. This is like the beginning of writing. It's even pre-writing to some degree um, with the Greeks. So. Yeah, so the way I was taught this in my the, the history class I was talking about was there was um part of it was also the the land that they had, right? The that they have an interesting geography that's hard to conquer because there's there's water and then there was a big oh that's that's how my is that do you think I that's know okay? I, I've heard that one too. It's you don't think that's a right? explanation for for man. Well I, the way, geography Geography does not bring these sorts of things about. You could argue that the the Nile dwellers had a protected situation where they had a, a desert to the west that nobody could cross. To the, yeah, the Mediterranean to the north. I mean, and and uh, so so why didn't they get get this going? Uh, yeah. Well, so what I, what I was going to say with you, though, what, you, what you're saying that I think is really interesting is I, it's got to be some kind of combination, right? Where so they, they are having trade. So they're able to trade with other cultures. It's harder for them, other cultures to, co- to conquer them. That's one thing. But along what you're saying, they also, you know, had the people that were there to and they could explore these ideas. And since, you know, like so if they were able to explore these ideas, but then this big Egyptian, you know, culture. Well, well they were, the Greeks culture. were very proactive and ambitious about colonizing. Okay. And yeah. Trading and yes. being productive. Yeah. Yeah. They so, wanted a better life. Uh, you know, they weren't sitting back in Athens and things yeah. somehow happened for them because they were in a certain geographical location. They were very proactive and very mm-hmm. ambitious 
and they achieved uh, a great deal by colonizing uh, the Mediterranean. Yes, and I guess I'm just so I'm just and wondering they took if, advantage of the Mediterranean. They, they, I mean, they figured yeah. out how to take advantage of that that arena, so to speak, of trade with other peoples, with the Egyptians, and well, and then you know they they opened up a, a port uh, in Egypt in the Delta region. And they took advantage of that. They they uh, saw the Egyptian statues. Mm-hmm. That has been very impressive. Yeah, for the Greeks to see uh, other people's artworks. You know, uh, much older civilizations than theirs. And they didn't just blandly look at it and go, "Oh wow, that's really you know good for you." <laughs> they they react. They emulated. And yeah. then not only emulated, but then pushed the model mm-hmm. and ended up and, and know, learning the from this thrower and the, the diadem bearer and the yeah. Parthenon. And, I mean, uh, which w- was revolutionary. Yeah. No one had had thought of, of making art like that. So they took the they were um, opportunistic. They yeah. were ambitious. They were proactive. Uh, they behaved as though they regarded the world as their oyster. Oh, I love that. Yeah, and I, I guess, yeah, I. I so the, I, we talked about all that. And I, I agree with all that. I'm just thinking, if they would have been conquered earlier, they could not have done a lot of that. So there seems to have been trade is fundamental, and maybe we could even say that the beginnings of western like what is unique to western and all this is the desire to to progress and get be- the desire to get better even in the sense of um you know not that i have to do it completely from scratch but that i'll take the best from other cultures so this is something that yeah, the west is learn, always learn from learn. others yeah and learn from others so the and greeks grow yeah the greeks on that knowledge and the romans were both like that a lot where they would you know, say, oh yeah, this is a better way of doing it. Let's do that. And that's something, by the way, I have to say today, we have this term cultural appropriation, which to me is just the most bizarre. I don't know if you've heard that term. I've just heard the most bizarre. Yeah, like the I idea today is that, it. well, the idea today is you're not supposed to appropriate. Like it's not appropriate for a, you know, white person to appropriate something, quote unquote, from a black cult person, right? Or black culture. And, you know, when I think about like, that's so anti- progress and thinking like really we should the best ideas the best you know things should win out and that's you know always been part of the western culture now they talk about it as like it was exploitative that you know you would take something and then take it you're taking it away from this other culture versus yeah let's have a culture where we have the we everyone comes together you know i always like the story um in athens where and and this just again blows my mind because you would not hear this in other places they they had not only the Greek religions, but they let other people have religion, their, their temples there, right? They would have other people that would trade there and they became this cosmopolitan area. Cause it's like, yeah, let's let, you know, you could trade. We want and you to that, trade. That was area. definitely the case with the Romans and the Romans for sure. They even took that, I think a little farther where they'd say, you know, you have to have our politics, but you could do whatever you want and your right. culture to some degree, right? right? Which you have to, you know, render under Caesar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, to me, it's just very interesting. And I think you, when you're reading your book, Windows on Humanity, that's what you're getting is you're getting the windows on humanity and you're, you're seeing the deepest things that people, you know, deepest things that people love. And maybe one of the last things we could talk about, unless you had, um, you know, because there's so much to talk about. There's so many pictures and stories. Um, but well, we could this, do another session sometime. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. I, I was actually going to ask you, actually, before I, should, before I go back to that, um, have you ever heard of a game, video game called Assassin's Creed Odyssey? No, Has I have not. <laughs> so the reason I bring <laughs> it up, imagine? I'm not a big gamer, but the reason I bring it up is you can watch YouTube videos of archaeologists, ancient Greek historians playing this game because of how detailed it is for ancient um, on ancient Athens and ancient Greece. So it's, it's not exactly 100% accurate, but it's very detailed. And what I tell everybody that, you know, because I love Greece and I say, go, you know, uh, enjoy Greek art, go check this stuff out. When you play this game, 
what's really interesting, just again, forget the, the fighting stuff. There's actually a teaching mode and oh. you can actually just be a scholar and move around all these sites oh, cool. that they have. It's, it, yeah, there's a teaching mode in it. And it's very beautiful. It looks really r- robust. But what I really take away from it, and I tell everyone you have to play it for this one reason, is it's almost impossible for us today to understand what it was like to live in a time when you walk down the street and there are sculptures everywhere. Oh, there's yeah. art all around and there's yeah. big sculptures. There's little sculptures. There's life size. There's, you know, the, what is the, the yes. big, the big Athena one by the, you know, that the, the, the glint of the helmet would. Their cities on. were forests yeah. of statuaries. And you cannot fathom that unless you experience it. And yes, I think we, we really are, are living in, 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 in depth. Deprivation. deprivation yeah aesthetic deprivation yeah. We, we don't know uh we don't know that about ourselves and you cannot you know that really realize about it until you, exactly. you learn until you what, yeah what the greeks did and that's why i think everyone should read the greeks and play this game for that exact reason because <laughs> that's one thing you get um is that you get to see that and it's just so amazing to see all the, like everything they did was beautiful they, they, you know, the, again, the pottery, you know, just pottery. Like I have plates in my house and they're just white plates, right? Like it's boring. They had cool plates with like Penthesilia. Yes. The, box, or something, the right? base paintings. Base painting. And I just, better. it's just such an amazing culture. Okay. So we can finish off by talking about this mm. a little bit. Yes. He's, uh, this is the dying warrior from the pediment of a temple uh, in that, um, borderline time-wise between the archaic and the classical Greek when uh, the human figure was coming alive in in sculpture and to some degree in painting and um, he, uh, he this figure was was at the corner of the pediment this is this is a set up high uh, above the entablature of, of a temple and he uh, depicts um, a warrior who's uh, dying, and he has he probably held a weapon in oh, his this... uh, his right hand, and his left hand is yeah. still on his shield. This is not a great angle uh, on this particular piece, but this mm. was the image I was able to obtain permission free. Mm. Um, the um, what's remarkable about this figure is the um, portrayal of defeat Mm -hmm. yet the figure is magnificent this is not um, a pathetic figure this is not agony um, not like what we see in in later Hellenistic works like the Laocoon um, we really get a sense of that this man is noble. Um, he, he's at the prime of life. Um, it's tragic because he should have his whole life ahead of him, and yet he's dying. And the, the tragedy of the situation is um, dramatized by his left hand, which curves it's almost like a a wilting plant Mm -hmm. um if he had all the digits of his hand we would see that even more so uh and and that gesture that wilting gesture is uh encircled by the frame of his of his shield so that's where our attention goes that's the focal point is that one hand and uh, it's really a, a remarkable um, dramatization of the heroic, um, not be even though defeated and tragic, not being pathetic. And I, I will encourage people that if you Google this, there are other images 
that yes, you where can you see find. it more straight on. And you can see the hand that she's talking about, which you can't oh, see. Oh, it's, it's been yeah. restored. Because people, yeah, someone, or even just yes. like in, in an image yes. of it. And that, that's very legitimate that some somebody's done a restoration based on the information in the yeah. original fragment. And I'll, I'll put it in the comments because I think it's worth, um, you know, after the show, because I think it's worth looking up. It's, you know, the, the Fallen Warrior marble, if you Google that, 480 BC, um, you know, you can, you can find that. I run something called the Lit Literary Canon Club. It's an exclusive club. We read from Homer to Goethe, and it's kind of encourage and help people read books that they always put down. And I love the Iliad. I've loved the Iliad since I was a kid. I think that's why this always struck me is because there's so much death in that. But it's taken me like 20 years to realize the, um, the death in Homer and especially in the Iliad, it's not actually about the death, which is what we, especially modern people tend to focus on. It's, you know, we focus on the, the brutality of what happens in the Iliad, where it's like, you know, he was skewered through the throat and the, the groin right. and the stomach. It's graphic. And, and it's very yeah. graphic. But when you actually read it, and I've read it several times in different translations, what Homer actually does, and I think this plays into the, the culture of Greece and what they're really focused on is he will often have like a, a formulaic way, sometimes short, sometimes several paragraphs, sometimes, you know, longer of, you know, uh, Samoy of, of the village was, was born by this river. His mother, you know, uh, gave great birth to him and his father was so proud and he, he would work and, and play and, and, and he would, they would tell this whole life story and, you know, Ajax ended Samoy's, the younger with the skewer to his throat, you know, and it's this whole thing demonstrating the beauty and the, the, of life and with the life that he held and how yes. tragic it is that the life is gone. And like this kind of emphasis on that. And I always thought there's so much stylistically of that in Homer that I think we miss. And you see a lot of that pathos here, like you're saying, and it's, you know, the wilting of the, the hand and things like that. Yes. So. Yes. And they certainly didn't, glorify death as as some something that you would want or as a pathway to a better yeah. life or a better world like you get 70 virgins or whatever type thing right right like, the islamic world the christian yeah. world the ancient egyptian world uh, had this view of an afterlife as being potentially superior to to this life and yeah. you don't get that in the in the greeks Death yeah. is bad. It's tragic, and, and particularly when it's a hero who who perishes, it's it's tragic. It is, yeah. It's very tragic, and they, you know, they like you said, they they get you to feel the the tragedy and the sadness of it, but you also see him as this grand epic heroic yes. man yes. fighting it, for what he believes. It's in. not tragedy as an end in itself. It's yeah. a way of of paying tribute to and acknowledging the greatness of an individual fighting for his values. And I think yes. um, the last, you know, the last thing I'll say is um, for a couple of you have purchased the book already on this chat. So thank you for doing that. Make sure you leave a review on Amazon. Um, oh yes. That's very please, important. Yeah. So it please doesn't leave have a review. to be lengthy or yeah. erudite, just love the book. Anything will help. Something, yeah. Um, so make sure you do that. Make sure you you buy the book. You know, there's there's a, I I didn't go through my whole list of who I think this is great for. I think you know besides humanities, I think if you're a homeschool per, um, parent, yes, yes, uh, for homeschoolers to great for uh, educate themselves before yeah. they teach. Yes, yeah. Well, I, I think the parents and, and, I, and it be inspiring for uh, curriculum development for homeschooling. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and there's a lot you could pull from. Like, you don't have to read through the whole thing with your kids, but you can pull sections out to teach them about, okay, let's learn about Paleolithic man. Let's learn about Neolithic. And you have it all categorized. So, and you have resources. People can go and expect, you know, go to this website and get some more. And you can create your own thing, you, you know, your own, you know, little lectures quite e easily and lay yes, out with this. So yes, I really the recommend art makes it that. easy. Exactly. Because it's a visual that you can show. Uh, to the child uh, or teenager, and uh, it's vivid and and it's it's in, in inspiring for discussion and discovery. 
discussion and discovery. I think that's a great way to end it. So this has been a great discovery of you, Sandra, well, and your thank work. Thank you for having and me. And yeah, thank it. you so much. I had a great time. Everybody, please go support, buy the book, read it, put it on your coffee table, be sophisticated, uh, enjoy great <laughs> art and enjoy the pleasure of great art. And um, next time you go to someone's house, make sure you ask them about all the stuff in their house so they can light up and tell you about it. Um, so Sandra, thank you so much. This has been a blast and I hope to talk to you again soon. Real pleasure. Yeah. Thank Onward you. and upward. Onward and upward. All right. Thank you, everybody.